All right, welcome to 1.06. Um, before getting started with this video, I would recommend doing a short, quick, but efficient um, and worthwhile studying of the first um, five lessons um, on limits. That way, when you uh, get into this video, um, you won't have to stop and review concepts and it will go more smoothly. This particular um, lesson is going to be a little bit of a combination of some of the questions from the squeeze theorem uh, lesson along with uh, mixed review and some selected solutions. What I would encourage you to do is um, after you solved all of the various questions in this video um, to compare and, and uh, discuss with the fellow classmates to make sure um, that you have done them correctly before taking the quiz on Monday. Okay, these are the helpful limit properties that we talked about in class, and they are good to apply once you already have a solid foundation um, in evaluating uh, many different limits, uh, because they can take something that's very complicated and split it up into things that you're familiar seeing, um, so that you can then evaluate multiple limits um, to evaluate the original one. So I'll go through these um, rather quickly. They should be very intuitive. Uh, the first is that if you're taking the limit of a function plus or minus another function, um, you can split them up, take the limit of each function as x approaches the same value a, and then add or subtract those two limits that you evaluate. Uh, the same is true of multiplication, so if you're taking the limit of something times something else, you can then take the limit of each one individually. And this leads to the corollary um, pretty simple where if one of your functions is a constant, just some value c, um, you can factor that constant out of the limit and then just a limit the uh, just take the limit of the function f and then multiply by c. Um, and then the last one uh, which is pretty obvious as well is that if you are taking the limit um, of a function divided by another function, you can take the limit of each function separately and then divide. All of these are dependent upon the fact that the limit exists um, for each of these separately. So obviously if the limit of f of x as x approaches a doesn't exist, um, it would be impossible for you to add doesn't exist to some value. So that should be pretty intuitive as well. Um, but these can be very helpful because if you have something that looks complicated but you notice a part of it which looks familiar you can work to isolate it either by you know having that thing that looks familiar multiplied by something else um, or added or subtracted with something else and then you can split it off and hopefully you'll be able to not only take the limit of the thing that looks familiar but the other one will actually work out as well okay and the same is true for um, division and the constant um, that you can factor out Sometimes it's just helpful to kind of clear up the, the space that you're taking the limit of, um, and uh, but overall it's not going to be that drastically cha uh, changing anything. Okay, so um, now we're going to revisit uh, some of the questions from uh, 1.05 on the squeeze theorem. Uh, I, of course, recommend that you try these on your own first. I'll discuss a few of them um, in greater detail than others, um, and then obviously you should compare uh, and contrast with fellow classmates. All right, so after reviewing the, um, the squeeze theorem, uh, this should be uh, easily doable for you. Go ahead and try these on your own, and we'll talk briefly about them in a second. All right, so for number one, um, here we're trying to use the squeeze theorem. And so what we need is to find two functions which are going to squeeze the function x squared times sine of 1 over x. And they also need to have the same limit as x approaches 0. And so what we'd like to do is set up an inequality that will help us arrive at, a fu at two functions that squeeze uh, x squared sine of 1 over x. So the first thing that we want to notice is that sine of 1 over x itself is going to be between the values 1 and negative 1. 
Okay, so if you consider the first and the fourth quadrant um, as those are an interval around x equals zero, that's always going to be true, right? Sine can never be greater than one or less than negative one. And I guess we could say greater than or equal to as well. It, it doesn't really matter. And so then notice that we're very close to having this function. We just need to multiply by x squared on both sides. And that will give us exactly what we're looking for. So we have x squared sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to x squared and greater than or equal to negative x squared. Okay, And this um, should make sense just thinking about it from the perspective of if you have something that's always less than 1 in absolute value, then whatever it's being multiplied by is going to decrease in value. And so this sine of 1 over x is essentially just going to take the x squared function and decrease its value. So it's going to be less than x squared, and negative x squared is always going to be less than this value. And so if we picture what this graph looks like, and we graph the function x squared. That's a decent attempt at best. And then the function negative x squared. It's also pretty poor, but you get the picture. And we agree that as x approaches 0, both of these functions have a limit that approaches 0 as well. And since x squared sine of 1 over x is always in between those two functions, and in fact, if you graphed it, you would see that it looks something like that. Um, then we know that the limit as x approaches 0 of this function is also going to be 0. Okay? So ultimately, what we can conclude is that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times sine of 1 over x is equal to zero. And the reason we can say that is first we have this fact and then in addition to this fact we have that the limit as x approaches zero so I'll just write this down here the limit as x approaches zero of negative x squared is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of positive x squared which are both also equal to zero and so the squeeze by the squeeze theorem, we then have that this statement is true. Okay, for number two, um, I recommend that you uh, prove this by multiplying by the conjugate. So I'll show you the first couple of steps and you should be able to go from there. All right, so multiplying by the conjugate at first uh, makes this look a little more complicated. But notice that originally the reason we couldn't just plug in zero is that our denominator went to zero. And our numerator does too, but that's actually not a problem. The only problem is with the denominator. So when we multiply by the conjugate, notice now that in uh, substituting in 0, the numerator is still 0, right? Cosine of x is 1, one and 1 squared is 1. And so that the numerator is 0, but the denominator is 0 plus 1. And so the limit is just equal to 0. All right, here are a few more um, from class. These rely fairly heavily on those helpful limit properties. So look for things that are familiar, that we know how to take the limit of, and see if you can isolate those. And then um, you might find that the other piece that's left over, you can also uh, evaluate that limit as well. All right, um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, four of these and then a little more in depth on one of them. Uh, so for number three uh, here notice that you have sine x in the numerator so if you can find an x in the denominator you will be able to isolate sine of x over x and so if you factor out um, an x from the denominator you'll be able to separate the limit and have the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x times the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over 2x minus 1 and then you can evaluate each limit. Uh, for 4 here, 
you can split this up because the numerator has addition here so it'll be the limit as x approaches 0 of x over x plus the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x and you can evaluate both of those. Here sine squared of x is just sine of x times sine of x and so you can split this up and you can take the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x times the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x. And then for 7, this looks eerily similar to 1 minus cosine of x over x, just with a 5 multiplied into the numerator. So factor that out, pull it outside of your limit, and then take the limit as uh, x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine of x over x, and you'll end up with 5. For 6, I want to discuss this one a little bit because it takes uh, some sort of ingenuity with the limit properties. So if you are taking the limit as x approaches 0, and let's just factor out the 3 to begin with, okay, of sine now of 4x over sine of 3x. And what we want here is an end game, something that we're going to work towards because we know we can evaluate that limit. And the limit that involves sine, which we proved with the squeeze theorem, is that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of nx over x is equal to n for any uh, value, any real value n. And so with that in mind, let's actually just write this over here. Limit as x approaches 0 of sine of nx over x is equal to n. Okay. So if we can get something that looks like this, we can evaluate that. So let's just notice first that sine of 4x is in the numerator. So if we can get an x in the denominator, then we can evaluate that limit. And we don't know what will happen with this denominator yet, but let's just deal with something that we know we can get a handle on and then deal with that other piece later. So to get an x in the denominator, what we need to do is multiply by x in the numerator and denominator, and this will allow us to rewrite our limit as 3 times the limit as x approaches 0. And now what we have is we have sine of 4x times x over, and I'm going to write this, this x that we multiplied by in front just to help us visualize, x times sine of 3x. Okay, so now we have a piece that we can break off and evaluate, right? And so let's go ahead and, and let's split that up now. So this is going to be 3 times, and now that we're splitting it up, um, it should hopefully make a little more sense. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 4x over x times the limit as x approaches 0 of x over sine of 3x. Okay, so let's look at the pieces that we are fully capable of evaluating, right? 3 is obviously 3. And then sine of 4x over x, well, the limit is, as, that approaches, as, as x approaches 0 of that is just going to be 4. So now we're left over with is this limit as x approaches 0 of x over sine of 3x. Well, that looks eerily familiar to the property that we proved. So eerily familiar that it should lead us to think about manipulating this equation so that it actually tells us something about this. And to do that, what we need to realize is that we need to invert it. Okay, But there's no rule that says we can just invert right off the bat. We can't, you know, we don't want to mess with the inside of the limit. So what if we applied the quotient rule that says we can take the limit of the numerator and divide it by the limit as x approaches 0 of the denominator? Well, then we'll just have a fraction. And if we just have a fraction, we know the rules of, in, of inverting things with fractions, and so we can apply that. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to scoot over to the right just a little bit. And so I have n on the right, and now on the left I have the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of nx 
divided by the limit as x approaches 0 of x. Okay. Now, what you want to be careful about is not actually evaluating any of these limits. Okay? That's what we need to be careful with. Um, because we already have an equation, there's no need for us to actually evaluate these limits. What we want is just to reverse or flip their spots. So what we can do is we can invert each side. So now on the right side, we have 1 over n. And on the left side, we'll just have the limit as x approaches 0 of x in the numerator divided by the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of nx. Well, the quotient rule tells us that if you have the limit of a numerator divided by the limit of the denominator, and both of them are the limit as x approaches 0, then you can just take the limit of the quotient. So what we can do is we can just say, okay, forget taking the limit of the two parts separately. This is just the limit as x approaches 0 of x over sine of nx. And what is that going to be equal to? 1 over n. So this is actually another property that would be helpful to write down with those, those two other trig properties. And this allows us to evaluate this limit because this is x over sine of 3x. So my n value is 3, and so the value of this limit is 1 over 3. And now simplifying this, 3 over 3 is 1, and so the value of this limit is 4. Quite a bit of work, but it is fruitful because we do learn um, another property that we can apply and hopefully a couple tools in the toolbox as far as using the quotient property. Okay, so now um, I'm going to talk briefly about a protocol for uh, when we are faced with a limit and we want to evaluate it uh, to, in order to be most efficient. And then I'm going to present you with uh, some, some review uh, questions for you to go through uh, if you want some extra prep for the quiz. So when we're taking a test, we want to make sure we have efficient methods to attack problems with. And so it will be helpful at this point for us to create an algorithm or protocol for when we see a limit right, that we can kind of work through it really efficiently and make sure that we get to a correct answer. The last thing that we want to do is be trying every method under the sun and not sure which one is going to work or, you know, whatnot. So what I would encourage you to do is try and come up with this on your own, right? You have all the tools you need. Think about, you know, what would be the most efficient and easiest method. If that doesn't work, what should I do? If that doesn't work, what should I do? Imagine you don't have a calculator, right? Um, and think of maybe some special cases, um, you know, for example, with asymptotes and, and limits uh, as x approaches infinity uh, that you can, you know, quickly go off and, and you know, do something with. Um, so go ahead and just write that out for yourself. I will uh, write out what mine is. It's very basic, um, but just something so that you have an approach for when you are faced with evaluating a limit. All right, here's my protocol that I run through. Um, and just so you know, we're, we're still going to learn some techniques for evaluating limits that are far more powerful than the ones we've learned so far. Um, so this will change as the year goes on. Um, in particular, something called L'Hopital's rule uh, is going to be very, very useful once we learn um, how to differentiate functions. And so, you know, this is kind of a living document. But for now, um, there are kind of a four, maybe five steps that, that I run through. The first is I, I look at the limit, and I'd like to use substitution. So if the function's continuous at that point, meaning it's not undefined, then I can just plug in the value and hopefully, you know, get something out, and, and that, of course, will be the limit. If not, that means it's undefined. It's either 0 over 0 or some value, n over 0. If it's n over 0, that's telling me that the numerator is going to, you know, a constant term, whereas the denominator is getting closer to 0, which means I'm going to have plus or minus infinity. And so I'm thinking vertical asymptote, and I should try and make sure that's correct. Now, if it's 0 over 0, there's a good chance that a little algebraic manipulation will do the trick. And so certainly factoring to try and cancel 
determine the denominator that goes to zero would be very helpful. Multiplying by the conjugate can also work and using limit properties to sort of break the, the function up into more manageable functions. I also want to mention here that if you have a limit as x approaches infinity, that's something that when you notice at the beginning, and so you can kind of think of this as step zero, if you have the limit as x is approaching plus or minus infinity, what you want to then remember is that you can just use some algebraic manipulation to create as many situations where you have some value n over x to some power because the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of that will be zero. And so if you can get as many of these zero terms in your, um, in your function, um, then you're going to be able to evaluate it much more easily because a lot of them will go to zero and then you're left with you know, just a couple of things left that you can easily evaluate. All right, so if algebraic manipulation does not work, um, then you can always, your fail-safe option is to use a numerical approach and make a table. Obviously, if you have a calculator, this is a lot less time-consuming, even though it's still kind of a pain. Um, and if you don't have a calculator, it really is a pain. And here, you're just evaluating the limit as x approaches a from the left and as it approaches a from the right, making sure they're equal. And you know, obviously, if they, they're not, then the limit does not exist. If your numerical approach doesn't work, right, then it likely does not exist. Um, and one more thing to say about this numerical approach is that you might think, oh, let me create a graph. Creating a graph is not going to be as, as fail-safe as making a table. Um, obviously, if a graph is provided to you, use it. But don't make one um, out of thin air. Uh, it's usually not going to be helpful. Um, and then I put down here, use the squeeze theorem. That's probably not going to be a good use of your time um, unless, of course, they give you some information in the question that relates to the squeeze theorem. So maybe they give you two other functions that um, you know sandwich or squeeze the function in question. If that's the case, then it might be worth going down that, down that path. But in general, you're not going to want to use it unless it's like kind of really obvious or they give you some special information. So that should be a good start and should help you make sure that you are confident in your strategy. Um, and so now let's go ahead and I'll give you a couple of practice problems. Of course, all the problems we've done in the past would also be good to do. Cover up your answer, try it again, compare, and if need be, review some topics. All right, so the, I put together about 10 or so questions. Um, there you know, could potentially be something that isn't necessarily on here that uh, might show up on the quiz. So make sure that you understand all of the concepts from all of the different lessons. But this would certainly be a good step in the right direction. Um, you should be able to uh, answer all of these um, and, and feel confident about your answers. Um, and certainly uh, feel free to debrief with each other and um, you know, work together to, to answer some of these if, if need be. I would recommend uh, trying them on your own uh, first, obviously. Um, and uh, make sure you follow your protocol. Uh, I'll go ahead and move to the next slide now. So uh, here are a couple more. Um, some of these can be a little more challenging, but nothing that you can't handle. Um, and some of them are meant to, to test different concepts. Um, uh, or multiple concepts at once. Uh, number 11 and number 12 are just some things for you to make sure you can do, state and understand all definitions and theorems. That's hugely important. Um, you can bet that there will be a question uh, on this quiz and on the AP test that just tests your understanding uh, of the definitions. And then lastly, um, if you are you know just bored, I would understand how to prove the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x equals 1. Um, I won't ask you to prove it from scratch, but certainly um, might want to ask you a, a particular question about it uh, or about, in general, how the proof is done. So uh, I'll be uh, in early, of course, on Monday if you guys want to get there early and ask uh, some questions. If not, good luck studying, and I'll see you guys um, 
on Monday.